spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, good morning. Thanks for tuning in here. It is 1030 here in Hawaii. So it's time for Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yanji Denise, and we are live this morning on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, Yanji, we reconnect with a guest we've had a few times on this show, but always uh, such an uh, insightful and educational conversation we have with him. That's right. We are welcoming back Dr. Tim Brown from the East West Center, infectious disease expert and senior fellow there. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, my pleasure to be back. Well, let's start with where we are as a state. That's where we always like to start with you. How are we doing here in Hawaii, particularly as it relates to other states across the continent? Okay, why don't you bring up that first slide? Uh, I think, you know, in, in as you can see in this graph, this is for Oahu rather than state, but the statewide picture looks very much the same. Uh, in the last few weeks, we've been fairly stable. Uh, you can see that basically starting in late August, our cases kind of stabilized and they've been on a very slow decline perhaps, but pretty much flat over that period. And right now we're currently at about 105 cases per day was the, the report from the last HDOH report. And that's probably an underreport because we know the home tests are not getting reported. but Nonetheless, you know, it's, it's a kind of low and stable sort of situation. Relative to the rest of the U.S., I think we're pretty much in the same place. If you actually look at the cases per 100,000, the U.S. is 11 per 100,000. We're 11 per 100,000. Uh, the U.S. has eight hospitalizations per 100,000 people. We have seven hospitalizations per 100,000. Now, we're doing better in terms of deaths by about a factor of three. We only have 0.03 per 100,000, whereas the U.S. as a whole is 0.11. But I would probably attribute that to the fact that we have better vaccination rates than the U.S. as a whole. So that's probably what's contributing to that. So I'd say, you know, we're, we're pretty much the same as the rest of the U.S., whereas I think we were stronger in terms of prevention in the first couple of years because of our masking. I think now we're pretty much in the same situation as the rest of the country because we're doing the same thing the rest of the country is doing. There's not a lot of masking going on right now. People have been falling behind on their boosters, and so we're seeing some waning immunity and so on. So we do have to be concerned about that. And I really want to stress, I think the boosters are really important, especially for those who are older, because they get your immunity back up again. And that includes your protections against hospitalization and death. And it's important to remember, we've still had 608 people die of COVID since January 1st of this year. So it's not like COVID is not still exacting a toll on our community, it absolutely is. Uh, and our wastewater numbers are basically bouncing around a bit, but there's no clear upward or downward trend there. Now, normally I, what I would say is actually, you know, if, if I didn't know sort of what was coming or have an idea of what was coming, I'd say this is sort of what endemicity looks like, where we're kind of at a low stable level of the virus. And this is probably where we'd stay, except we know that there's a whole bunch of new variants that are brewing right now. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, maybe let's dive into that a little more uh, if we can. And, and just to talk about the just general consensus in the community, I think a lot of people have put COVID behind them. We're back to normal with gatherings. Um, many of the uh, events that were once, uh, you know, altered in some ways to have capacity limits, those are kind of back at action. Uh, holiday seasons are coming up. I mean, what do you think the general message is for the community about COVID and these other variants? Well, I think, you know, the reality remains that our positivity rate in the test is still about 6%. So we are still seeing infections occurring in the community. There's absolutely no question of that. And by CDC's transmission levels, we still have a substantial level of transmission here in Hawaii. Uh, but the problem, I think, is that one reason why people are doing this is they're thinking of COVID in terms of the initial illness. And while it's true that with Omicron, the initial illness has not been as severe as it was with the earlier variants. And in fact, for many people, it's relatively mild, not, not just because of changes in the virus, but also because they have gained immunity basically from vaccination and from previous infections. Okay, so that's, that's reducing the severity as well. 
But I think what people need to think about also is the other factors that come into play with COVID-19. The initial infection, if it's severe, and there are still severe initial infections, can do organ damage and leave you with that for the rest of your life. Uh, there are still deaths occurring. As I mentioned, 608 people have already died this year, primarily among the elderly. So it's a real issue for older members of our population. It's important to remember that vaccines protections against severe illness and hospitalization do wane with time. And so it's really important, especially for the older members of our community and immunocompromised, that they go get that bivalent booster that's out there right now. They need that additional protection going into the upcoming holiday season where we do expect that there's going to be a wave of some magnitude. We don't know the exact magnitude yet, but we know it's coming. And it's important to remember that long COVID also leaves some people even with mild infections with long-term uh, neurological damage or cardiovascular damage. And so they may have problems with brain fog, inability to concentrate. For some people, these effects only last a few months. You know, some, many people recover after, you know, a month or two months or three months. For some others, unfortunately, probably for a small percentage of like one to 3%, it ends up being a long-term thing. And those, effect, those impacts may affect their ability to work. So, you know, it's important that people start factoring these things in when they think about protecting themselves and protecting especially the older and immunocompromised members of their families and their communities. Because I think that, you know, it's easy to say, well, for me, it's not really a problem, but it can still be a major problem for other members of the community. Well, let's build on that and look at some of the variant slides that you sent us. I'm just interested to know what variants are out there. You know, I see headlines from time to time about super variants and, you know, there's a lot of sort of scary headlines and it's hard for me to kind of muddle through those and figure out what we should actually be worried about. What can you tell us about variants here in Hawaii and also just around the world? Okay, let's put up that first slide. Okay, this is the variant mix in the United States starting back on the uh, left-hand slide, we're starting at the toward at the end of July, and then the last bar here is the uh, end of last week. And so you can see what we're seeing now is new variants are coming up. The, the two we're kind of worried about right now are the BQ1.1 and the BQ1, because those are ones that can evade, they, they are very immune evasive. Uh, they basically are immune to the drugs that we have traditionally been using for treatment of COVID. Uh, not Paxlovid, but to the monoclonal antibodies and other uh, things that we deal with. And so they're a real concern. But what's been happening in the last couple of months, and next slide, is we've been developing this variant stew. <laughs> you don't have to get the details of this. But basically, these big guys, the orange one and the blue one here, are BQ1 and BQ1.1. So they're dominant in the United States. But there's a whole bunch of other variants that are playing out right now. Somebody actually counted these up, and last week, I believe, the children of BA2 and BA5, there were something like 517 of them that were being tracked right now. Now, what's interesting about these variants is they are immune evasive. They are, working, they are evolving to get around the current immunity that we have, whether that immunity is from vaccination or that immunity is from a previous infection. And the way they're doing this is they're finding a set of very specific mutations that allow them to work around that and also to work around the monoclonal antibody drugs that we have. And what we're finding is that they're converging down on just a set of like six or seven different mutations. So each of these has a different mix of those. Some have four, some have five, some have seven. And that's what's giving them the ability to evade our immune system and previous infection protections, okay? Now, the other real concern is that they're immune to our monoclonal antibody treatments, and that includes Evusheld, which we use for the immunocompromised, and the last monoclonal antibody, Beptilovimab, which was we were using basically for treatment of more severe cases, but those are gone now. Okay, so these variants are increasingly spreading in Europe, and I think you know that's what we have to be concerned about because Europe in the past has been kind of a bellwether for what's going to happen in the United States two or three months later. Okay, so why don't you pull up the next slide? Uh, this is showing you some European countries and also Singapore. So this is Austria, France, Italy. You can see that what happened is they saw these peaks, and these peaks, and these are very recent. Though, so this is you know this is the end of October that we're talking about at the end of this graph, or current, basically today. Uh, so fundamentally, what we're seeing is that they had a wave, and it was a mix of BA5 plus some of the 
uh, newer variants I've been talking about, predominantly BQ.1.1, which we know is now in the United States and is in fact the fastest growing variant in the United States. So the bad news is we're seeing these waves across Europe, and that means that we're probably going to see a wave here. In fact, we're already starting to see in the northeast of the country in states like New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, we are seeing hospitalizations and cases also rising. And it's important to remember our vaccines protections wane over time. Uh, so fundamentally, we can expect another wave in the US. Now, the other good thing about that, those waves in Europe, is you'll notice they didn't rise as high as the previous wave. They did not rise as high as the BA5 waves before them. So that gives me some hope that perhaps we'll be dealing with a smaller wave than what we've had in the past. It'll still be a wave. It will still produce a substantial number of hospitalizations and, and some deaths. And, but hopefully it will not be as bad as what we've seen in the past. So I think you know, that's the good news side of this thing. And so I do think that uh, there, the other good news is there's no evidence that these new variants are more severe in terms of the illness that they caused than previous variants. So I think that, you know, the good news is the hospitalizations are not rising too high. Uh, why don't you put up the Singapore slide? This kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. So you see on the left-hand side, we've got the seven-day average of cases and they do a better job of tracking cases than we do. And they've turned over and they started basically last, last week in September was when they really started their rise. And they have the XBB variant, another one we're watching. But you'll notice their hospitalizations have also turned over, and they peaked at about a little under 600. And Singapore has a population of about 6 million, about you know five times our population. So that would correlate here to probably peaking somewhere around 100 to 150 hospitalizations, which fortunately for us is something that we can probably manage. Now, the, the, the other interesting thing, because I know we were off camera beforehand, Yunji asked, about this. Uh, the Singapore data is actually quite interesting because they allow us to look at reinfections. Okay, one of the things that Singapore has observed with XBB coming in, which is one of these more immune evasive, it can avoid the protections, is that their rate of reinfections has risen very rapidly in the last month. Okay, for most of the BA5 wave, their, their reinfections were at about the 5% level. They were very, very low and stable. Okay, that is 5% of new infections that they detected were reinfections. But when XBB came in, they saw that rise up. The last figure they showed was 17% and it was still climbing. Okay, and that illustrates how XBB can work through both vaccine protections and previous infection protections in terms of getting you infected. Because it's important to realize Singapore has a 95% vaccinated population with 70, 79% of them having at least one booster. So they are in a much better situation relative to vaccines and previous infections than we are. But nonetheless, they're still seeing, you know, about one in five new infections right now is a reinfection because these new variants are so good at evading that. But the other interesting thing there is they looked at when you had your last infection and what kind of protection did you get? Okay, and these were looking at Omicron infections during this year. And what they found was if you had your last infection between one and three months ago, you had very little chance of getting reinfected. So fundamentally, you get about a three-month grace period after your last infection, during which your chances of getting reinfected are very, very low. It's still possible. It was like, you know, one, one five hundredth of basically what people who had not been previously infected we're getting, but it's very, very low. Uh, if you get out to seven to 10 months, it's about 44% the chance of getting infected as somebody who was never infected. So you lose about half your protections by seven to 10 months out. And if you looked at somebody who had a previous Delta or pre-Delta infection, that is more than a year ago, they had no additional protection relative to somebody who was never previously infected. So basically, that protection you get from a previous infection is short-lived. Basically, it's you know it's it's good for the first three months. It's half gone by seven to ten months, and it's totally gone after about a year. So it's important to keep that in mind if you think that your previous infection is going to protect you from getting infected again. 
Well, I want to stay on this topic of, of vaccines and, and, you know, you referenced it a few times with Hawaii and just our initial rollout of the vaccines and the amount of people that got it. Uh, one of the states that saw a higher percentage of the population going out and getting it. Uh, we have seen with the boosters, though, that number go down. And now with this bivalent vaccine, uh, you know, officials from the Department of Health have even said that the numbers aren't where they had hoped it would be. Uh, knowing that we are seeing sort of this um, decline in the number of people who are getting vaccines. I mean, how concerning is that long term and how much will that impact us from where we were? I mean, does is that initial round of vaccines that we received where Hawaii got high marks for, is that still carrying over to what we're seeing here today? I, I would say, you know, the protections of that initial round, you know, those first two doses, those are pretty much totally gone. OK, they will still protect you against severe illness and death they'll reduce your risk of getting severely ill or dying but they're, they're not 80 90 percent like they used to be you know we're probably talking 40 maybe 50 percent protection against severe illness and death if all you had was the first series now if you got one of the boosters you're probably protected for, for about six months you know, you're protected for two or three months after the booster from infection at higher rates Although, again, not at the 95% rates we saw in the early days, probably at 60%, 70% protection levels. And you, again, get a boost probably for eight to nine months in terms of your protection against hospitalization and death. So the boosters are really important. Now, the new bivalent booster, this new booster, is really important because it has some BA5 in it. It has some Omicron in it, as well as some of the original Wuhan, original uh, COVID variants. Okay, so that actually can give you better protection against these new variants that are coming in, most of which are descended either from BA2 or from BA5. Okay, so they're basically in the same family. And so the bivalent booster will actually elevate your protection. Again, it won't give you perfect protection against infection. My, my guess, and we don't have any data at this point, my guess is you'll probably get 60, 70% protection for two or three months uh, from the bivalent booster against infection but you will get a significant boost to your protection against hospitalization and illness probably for seven to eight months. Okay, so especially for the older members of our community, the immunocompromised, anybody who knows they've got a pre-existing condition that could put them at great risk of COVID illness, they really want to go get the bivalent booster. And so I really strongly recommend that, especially given that we know these new variants are coming that are more immune evasive. So they, they will also make these boosters less effective than they would have been otherwise, but nonetheless, the booster will probably still be fairly effective against them, especially in the first few months. So it's definitely worth going out and getting the bivalent. In terms of where we are, I think we're probably not that much different than the U.S. as a whole, where I think they're only at about 10% uptake right now. It's very, very low. And that's really concerning since, like I say, we're starting to see a wave rising in the Northeast, and that will certainly almost certainly play out across the country the way it has in the past. And so that's, I think, going to be a real issue. So this booster is really important. And I really want to encourage people, especially going into the holiday season, when we know people will be traveling, people will be getting exposed to COVID in other places where there may be higher rates of these new variants. It's really important that you basically get boosted before you make those trips uh, and before you go into large holiday gatherings and so on over Thanksgiving and Christmas. So I think it's the booster is really important and we really want to encourage people to go get it. You know, you mentioned how uh, evasive these new variants are. And on that topic, Anne-Marie has this question. If every shield, I, I, I can't pronounce the second one, <laughs> but if these two medications are no longer effective for the immunocompromised, what can these folks do? Uh, what is your recommendation for those folks who are concerned about what is coming? Well, I think, you know, the first recommendation is absolutely get boosted. Uh, the boosters are not worthless for people who are immunocompromised. They do help. They just don't give as much of an immune response as they do for those with a, a full immune system. So I think that the for the immunocompromised, what they have to do is they have to step up their other precautions. Okay. And so, I mean, step up your masking. If you're not using an N95 mask now, switch to one. Because the N95 will give you much greater protection, even in the absence of other people masking. Uh, you know, do be careful. You know, if you're getting together with relatives or something and you don't know their immune status, use COVID tests before gathering. I think, you know, the, the same types of things that we've recommended in the past. 
And, you know, and the other thing is make sure that you have quick and ready access to Paxlovid. So if you do get infected, you can get tested quickly and you can basically get the Paxlovid treatment. That one is still working just fine against the, even these uh, new incoming viruses. So you really want to be able to get that. And that means, you know, what I would do, what I've done is I've actually contacted my primary care provider. I've made sure I've got all the tests, and anything else I need. So that if I call her and tell her I tested positive on a home test, she'll prescribe Paxlovid for me. And that kind of preparation, you know, calling your primary care provider, especially if you're immunocompromised, getting ready and having them prepared to issue a Paxlovid uh, prescription for you very, very quickly, I think is kind of a, a necessary sort of precaution to take just in case you do get infected. But you've just got to step up the other, the other factors that can help to protect you. And it's unfortunate, you know, because Evisheld was a real boon because it provided about six months of protection against the previous variants. But virtually all of these new variants basically have developed immunity to uh, Evisheld. You know, I want to bring up something else that made headlines, and that is just the rising number of cases that we're seeing in children with uh, what they're calling RSV, uh, respiratory illness, with many children who are finding themselves in hospitals throughout the nation. Uh, if you can talk a little more about what that is and what we're seeing here in Hawaii and if parents should be concerned about this at all. Yeah, RSV is actually a, it's a fairly common childhood infection. And, you know, it, it had disappeared to a large extent for the last couple of years because of COVID precautions that everybody was taking. Uh, you know, not unlike the flu, the flu was pretty much gone for the last couple of years. And now it's making a resurgence because everybody's dropped respiratory precautions. So it's coming back. RSV actually is a serious illness in children, okay? It uh, produces about 2 million outpatient visits for children every year. It hospitalizes about 58,000 children every year, and it kills 100 to 300 children each year. So RSV is not something you want your kids to be contracting. And so, you know, this, this is one reason I'm not overly comfortable with the fact that, you know, we have all these respiratory viruses going around, but we're not taking any precautions in the school. And we haven't done as much as we should have done to improve the ventilation and the amount number of air exchanges every hour in classrooms across the state, because that helps to reduce the spread of all respiratory viruses. So I think that, you know, parents really have to be careful. You know, if you're if you know kids are getting sick, then, you know, keep your kids away from those kids uh, because you don't want to pick up RSV. You don't want to pick up flu either. And flu is out there. Flu is coming back. Uh, the rate of flu last year in terms of samples tested was about 3.1%, or not last year, but in 2019, before the pandemic, was 3.1% at this time of year. Last year, or last week when CDC tested, they were getting 3.3%. So we're probably in for a more or less normal flu season. And again, where that's important is for young children who do see serious impacts of flu and older people who also can be hospitalized or die from the flu. Okay, so again, it's really important this year, especially for those two populations, get your flu shots. The flu shot this year, unlike previous years, is really very well targeted toward the current variant that is spreading. Okay, the current flu variant. So it's, it's a really good shot this year. It's likely to be very, very effective. So, you know, when you go to get that COVID bivalent booster, get your flu shot at the same time. Because we know if you say you're going to put it off and do it later, you might not come back and do it. Okay, so just get them both out of the way. You know, you'll, you'll probably be, you know, have a really sore arm and, you know, you might be really tired or sore, or, you know, suffer the same effects you suffered the last time you get a COVID booster. But again, you know, it's going to reduce your chance of illness and death going forward. And that applies to both the flu and to COVID-19. You know, I'm interested because a while back on one of our programs, you said that you thought we would be in this period of sort of waxing and waning with uh, with these surges for the next five years. What are you, you know, I mean, I know you're not a, you know, you, you're not a fortune teller, you can't necessarily predict, but as we look ahead, what, you know, is that still the prediction that we are going to be in this sort of state of limbo for at least the next several years? Well, let me preface everything I'm about to say with a, a quote from one of my colleagues, Jim Chin, who said, those who predict the future lie even when they think they're telling the truth. OK, uh, so with that said, my take right now, what it appears is happening is we have seen the virus 
in its current incarnation, move toward forms that cause less severe illness. They still cause severe illness for some people, as we've seen. You know, we still have people dying of COVID across the country. You know, probably 300 people a day right now are still dying. So, you know, it, it is still a serious problem going forward. But what we have noted is that we seem to be getting peaks that are reducing in their magnitude. You know, what I showed you in Europe, where the peak in Austria was lower than the previous peak in Austria. And that's actually what we would expect from disease modeling as population immunity builds up. And so what's happening is we're building up more and more population immunity, both from vaccinations, which is the preferred way to get your immunity, but also from previous infections. And that's reducing the level of severe illness that results from COVID, okay? Because your immune system is better equipped to handle with it. Your T cells basically have been primed. And they also, the T cells also broaden the response over time. So they learn to deal even with newer variants coming out because they're, they're developing antibodies within your body that basically can deal even with some of the new variants. Not perfectly, but they'll do a better job and probably keep you from getting severely ill and dying. And so we're seeing that. And so we're seeing kind of decreasing peaks. You know, in Europe, the, the BA1, BA2 waves were generally large the last Christmas. Those were huge. Okay. The BA5 peaks were a bit lower. Okay. And now these latest variant peaks, which are still partially VA5 peaks, also seem to be peaking at a slightly lower level. So unless the virus throws something totally out of left field, which I can't rule out, you know, we know how fast this thing is mutating because we've allowed so many infections to occur on a global scale, there's lots of room for evolution for the virus. But unless it comes up and throws some new thing that gets really nasty like the original SARS that had a 10% fatality rate, okay, then we're probably going to see, eventually we'll get down to the point where, yes, it will probably look like what we've looked like here in Hawaii for the last uh, several weeks, which is, you know, probably a, a low stable level that probably just keeps circulating in the community. We'll never get rid of it entirely, but it will kind of keep exposing people, not unlike what happens with the common colds right now. But with the caveat that it all depends on what happens with evolution. If the virus decides to suddenly make another big jump like it did with Omicron, you know, we were lucky the Omicron jump went in the direction of less severe illness. But the next big jump, if we're not careful, could go in the opposite direction. And then we'd be back in a really bad situation. Although, again, most majority of our immune protections would probably still hold. So we probably wouldn't see as much you know, really nasty illness and as many deaths as we might have seen otherwise, but we could see those illness and death rates go up again if the virus mutates in that direction. So that's, you know, that's my take right now. You know, let's keep our fingers crossed that we don't get a really nasty variant developing out there. And then hopefully we'll see these decreasing peaks over time. But caveat for Hawaii, remember, we're exposed to people from all over the world. So what happens anywhere in the world can come home to us here. Okay, so I think we've got to be really cautious there. You know, we're exposed to the northeast of the United States. We're exposed to the west coast of the United States. We're exposed to Europeans and to, to people coming from Japan and Singapore and places in Asia. So, you know, we get a lot of exposure. So, again, my recommendation for those who are at risk of serious illness, keep your precautions up. Okay. Everybody else may not be masking around you, but you really ought to be masking. I mask all the time. Okay. I'm not going out in public basically without my mask on because I'm aware of what long COVID can do. I'm aware of what COVID illness can do to somebody my age. And I really just don't see any reason to take the chance. The mask is a minor inconvenience for avoiding those things. And I will, you know, and I get my boosters and I basically stay up to date on those things. And I would really recommend that for others, especially anybody who's older, who's immunocompromised. Keep your precautions up, okay? Don't drop your precautions just because everybody is dropping them around you. And yeah, if you look like an oddball, fine. Be an oddball. But you'll be an alive oddball rather than a dead oddball. All right. Dr. Tim Brown from the <laughs> East West Center, thank you so much uh, for joining us and for giving us the updates and all the things that you're following. We really appreciate it and always enjoy having you on. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, Eugene, Ryan. Thank uh -huh. you.
always great to hear from him and really putting the numbers in perspective. I mean, it really does feel for so many of in our community that, you know, COVID's in the rear view and this is not really a thing. We're back to weddings and gatherings and all the things. Uh, however, Dr. Tim Brown saying that he really is encouraging everyone to get that bivalent booster if you haven't already. And given that so many folks in the community have had infections, there is this sense, well, I've already had COVID, no big deal, I'm not gonna get it. He you know, laid out the numbers and said for the first one to three months, yes, you have very enhanced uh, protections, uh, but that wanes rapidly over time. And folks who had gotten it you know, over a year ago, let's say with the Delta variant, they basically have no immunity from that past infection. And so he's really hammering home the need for the vaccine. Yeah, and also referencing the fact that maybe if you got those first initial two shots in that first round of vaccines that were made available, uh, and that many in Hawaii went out to get, that that has pretty much all been reset at this point in time with the amount of time that has passed and, uh, you know, with the different variants that have since come forward. Uh, it, and again, he is encouraging people to not only get the current bivalent booster, but also the flu shot, recognizing that the flu is once again in our community with more people getting back to gatherings and uh, you know social restrictions also kind of being lifted, that the flu will also be something that will impact uh, people around us. And so uh, always good to get an update from him and hear what's happening, not only here locally, but he of course follows what's happening nationally and internationally around the globe and getting those updates. And as he said, what we're seeing in Europe right now, we'll likely see here in Hawaii with those uh, new variants that are being found there, eventually making its way to our shores. Uh, but for the most part, a lot more optimistic than we've had clearly <laughs> in the past when he's been on uh, early on in the pandemic. But uh, always great talking to Dr. Brown. Yeah. And when you saw that slide of the variant, Stu, if you missed any part of our conversation, uh, when we log off here, go back and watch from the beginning, he had some great slides. You know, we're talking about hundreds of variants that are very evasive and any one of them, uh, you know, could go either way. He's saying that, you know, hopefully we sort of maintain this level and get lower and lower as time goes on. However, any one of those could mutate into something much worse. And that's also why he's stressing that it's so important to get the vaccination so that we do develop more protections and don't allow these variants to continue to multiply. So again, always great to hear from him. On Wednesday, we switch, back, we switch gears. We'll hear from three candidates who are running uh, to serve OHA at large. We, we are looking forward to that conversation, uh, a very important election. Of course, you probably have your ballot already. I know got, I got mine. And Oha is always one of those races where, you know, the, some of those names are not as familiar. And so we are going to have an exciting conversation right here on Wednesday. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. We thank you for tuning in. We'll see you right back here on Wednesday at 1030. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.